today I'm going to give a very brief overview of the gravitational wave research in Korea. So if you are interested in any specific uh, topic uh, that uh, our group is doing, you can invite the, the people actually doing, doing the work. So I, I'm uh, speaking mostly on behalf of the Korean Gravitational Wave Group, as well as uh, our new research center called Gravitational Wave Center for the Gravitational Wave Universe. Okay, so I'll uh, briefly introduce the, uh, our group, Korean Gravitational Wave, and uh, what we did and do in a Gravitational Wave Group. Uh, so this is composed of uh, more than 20 people. So, uh, so I cannot cover everything. I just uh, uh, cover a, a few topics. And then I talk about the Center for the Gravitational Wave Universe, which is uh, established very recently. Uh, and then uh, the select the recent works in our, our center. Okay, so I, I retired last year and I was trying to clean up my office, although I'm still keeping my office. Uh, and I found this old photo, which I completely forgot about. It was taken uh, during the second Lisa Symposium in August 2000 at Kolum near Potsdam. And uh, I, was, uh, I was invited there uh, due to some reason. And, um, and I, I didn't know most of the people at, at this meeting. And I uh, looked at this photo and found uh, the faces of these uh, famous people, including two Nobel laureates. Uh, Kipson was here and Reinhard Weiss uh, was hidden somewhere here, but I could uh, easily recognize him. And Ron Drebber, who passed away just before the, uh, in 2017, uh, was actually standing just next to me. And Bernard Schutz was the founding director of the uh, Albert Einstein Institute for gravitational physics. And uh, this is an auditorium of the, uh, not for that particular institute, but this is a complex of the institutes and they have nice auditorium. And uh, it was very new at that time. And uh, so I'm showing this figure just because um, I went there and gave a talk, but I was very, very impressed by the, uh, by the old, talks and topics covered there. It was about the LISA project, but uh, they most, most of the talks are about the experiments and how uh, they can uh, detect the gravitational waves and when they can detect the gravitational waves, etc. So before that, I, I knew about gravitational waves only from the textbook. And uh, I used uh, the terminology of gravitational waves uh, to some extent abuse uh, in order to, to uh, do the, uh, in order to understand the dissipation process in the star clusters, et cetera. And uh, then I realized that the gravitational waves is a real thing and you can actually observe. And I thought that we can do the astrophysics uh, using gravitational waves after this meeting, mm -hmm. sorry. So uh, soon after uh, I returned, I began to uh, talk to the uh, to my colleagues about the possibility of uh, of working on gravitational waves. So uh, many people uh, agreed and wanted to to do something together with me. So I formed a uh, gravita Korean gravitational wave group. And the kickoff meeting was held on November, in November 2003. And uh, although we formed the gravitational wave group, we didn't know what to do. So the, uh, we start, started working on the numerical relativity. And uh, soon, uh, Kung Won Kang, uh, who was, who was act actually at Kias at that time, uh, he moved to KIST in order to lead the numerical relativity group. 
uh, because KIST has a, a supercomputing center, and the supercomputing center uh, also promised us to, to provide their resources uh, to our group. Uh, I think you know that he's now at Chungang University. And then uh, we organized many, many uh, summer schools. So this is one of the summer schools we had uh, we had under the sponsorship of KIST as well as APCTP uh, in 2008. And um, I'm showing this figure picture because uh, uh, Gabriel Gonzalez was he was there. And uh, after this meeting, she came to my office and uh, said that, told me that you can actually join LIGO scientific collaboration because you have uh, uh, nice people and you have resources, etc. So that was a um, uh, very good encouragement. And then we prepared for the uh, for the uh, a proposal uh, to LSC in September two thousand nine. At the meeting, at the, at the the collaboration meeting in Budapest, and then uh, LSC council, council approved our proposal, and uh, MOU was signed uh, during the next uh, LSC meeting in uh, in Pasadena. So this is a signing of the MOU, and uh, this is uh, right, and this is. Uh, LIGO director at that time, what is, he's a, a, one of the Nobel laureate. Of course, this signing is only symbolic because uh, everything is done electronically, but uh, in order to celebrate the first uh, signing of MOU, uh, we actually uh, signed on the paper. And uh, then we continued uh, to do some uh, organization of, of the uh, meetings, etc. And this is the meeting, uh, first kind of uh, international meeting held in Korea about uh, gravitational waves uh, in 2013 at SNU. Uh, this was organized in a, short, a relatively short uh, time, but uh, fortunately at that time, uh, many of the leadership of the LIGO actually came to this meeting and encouraged us. So that's a very brief overview of the gravitational wave group. And uh, so the uh, Korean gravitational wave group, um, not everybody is in uh, LIGO scientific collaboration because you have some kind of obligation uh, in order to become a member of the LSC. So I'll just uh, show uh, list some items that uh, we are doing within LSC. And uh, this is the most recent works. Uh, we have uh, three particular areas. One is software or uh, data analysis. So in, in the uh, software part, we uh, develop deep learning based weak lending event search pipeline and optimization of parameter estimation uh, for CVCs with the low eccentricity and develop the code for Bayesian inference on gravitational data with hadronic uh, hyperbolic equation of state uh, based on density functional theory, etc. So this, these are the particular works of the uh, data analysis within LIGO. And, uh, uh, as a, a very sensitive uh, instrument, actually Li LIGO has many, many glitches and uh, you have to remove the glitches from the signal. Uh, I mean, you know, the glitches look uh, like almost like signal, but they are not. So uh, in order to understand the glitches, uh, the activity uh, of uh, the of the glitchy uh, classification, et cetera, is called the uh, de detector characterization. And there is a group working on detector characterization. And in particular, they do the uh, uh, develop, they develop machine learning model to classify and uh, trace 
the responsible or witnessing channels of knowing noises. And oh, this this is a this is not, not supposed to be here. And uh, as for the experiments, this is relatively new. Uh, we have uh, some members uh, who are working on the on collecting electron uh, diffraction data to get electron pair distribution function, which is essential for understanding and predicting mechanical losses of different uh, potential coating materials. This is very important for the uh, for the LIGO upgrade uh, because, uh, as you can see from the schedule of the uh, gravitational wave detector uh, runs, uh, the force observing run will start next year, early next year, uh, and last for about a year. Then uh, there is a, a big break, and during this break, they will go uh, to, in particular in uh, LIGO, they will go to the LIGO plus upgrade, which allows us to uh, increase the sensitivity again by uh, almost a factor of two uh, over the ones at O4. And this is uh, called A plus because uh, the, this is advanced LIGO and this is uh, upgrade of advanced LIGO. <clears throat> and the uh, target sensitivity of advanced LIGO is shown here. Uh, this is just the number for um, just a simple diagram for, uh, for many of you. But uh, I'd like to emphasize that the actual uh, bottleneck of the sensitivity here is the this uh, coating Brownian noise. And uh, if we can reduce this brown Brownian noise, the sensitivity at this bottom can further increase. And uh, so this is already the, uh, the uh, sensitivity curve assuming the mechanical loss of, of the coating material is for uh, uh, fourth of the one fourth of the advanced LIGO, and uh, that's not a simple task. So, uh, so the uh, uh, the coating people are struggling to find the uh, best uh, candidate, best material for the uh, coating coating uh, substance, and uh, this is part of the this efforts that the uh, uh, hunting uh, the best material. Okay, so this is a very brief overview of the uh, activities of our colleagues within LIGO scientific collaboration. Uh, KGWG also provides the computing resources to uh, LIGO community uh, through the uh, KIST. So KIST uh, provides significant computing resources to gravitational wave community, uh, both LIGO and CAGRA. I'll talk about CAGRA very soon. And uh, this is supported by the Global Science Experimental Data Hub Center, which is part of the KIST. KIST is mostly composed of the uh, supercomputing center and GSDC and uh, networking uh, network. And uh, these resources are part of the LIGO data grid tier two centers. So that, that means that the, any members of LSC can access to these resources. Uh, of course, GSDC does not, um, so not only supports the LIGO, but also supports other, many other experiments like Alice CMS, Bell 2, RUNO. The RUNO is a neutrino experiment and genomic research and uh, transmission electron microscope data and Poang acceleration lab. So this is, uh, we are part of this uh, GSDC and uh, this is the uh, summary of the uh, resources dedicated for gravitational waves. So in started in 2012 with uh, 204 core it has increased to around 1,000 core. And recently they added uh, GPU. Uh, so we have uh, six GPU uh, machines. 
and the, the uh, we also have a uh, disk space in order to store the uh, LIGO and Tagra data. Again, started very small, uh, small capacity. Now we have uh, 550 terabytes, and it will increase uh, by a factor of two in, a short, uh, in the near future. <clears throat> So we are grateful to GSDC for its general support uh, for computing and storage. Soon after we uh, joined uh, LIGO scientific collaboration, we were also invited to join LCGT. At that time, it was called LCGT, Large Scale Cryogenic Gravitational uh, Wave Experiments or whatever. Uh, so uh, the first workshop is in order to discuss the uh, collaboration on Kagra was held on January 21st in 2011 at uh, SNU. This is just one year after the joining of joining in LIGO. And uh, then uh, we also similar to LSC, we made a presentation at the LCGT face-to-face -face meeting held in August 2011. Uh, then uh, after that, 12 members are admitted to LCGT. And in, in the LCGT, uh, three of them were uh, experimentalists. And uh, then uh, we had the Frequent, very frequent uh, joint workshops twice a year or even three times a year uh, from 2012 to 2015. And uh, this is the third uh, workshop on December 21st, 2012, which was at, held at Sogang University. And maybe you can recognize uh, the professor here, uh, Professor Kyu Man Cho at Sogang University who has hosted uh, this, this meeting. And through this, these workshops, the collaboration grew and the Korea-Japan workshop was renamed to a Kagura International Workshop series uh, because still, still a large, largest number within Asia to uh, collaborating with Kagura is uh, Korean, but uh, Taiwan and China uh, expressed their interest to 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 work with the Kagra. So that's how why we uh, changed it to Kagra International Workshop. And first Kagra International Workshop was held at Kisti on June twenty three to twenty five. Uh, in 2016, and uh, then uh, it was held almost twice a year. That's the uh, that's the request by the uh, Takagi Kajita, uh, who wanted to have have a frequent meeting. Uh, so uh, the latest meeting was uh, KIW nine at Beijing. Uh, this year, this summer, <clears throat> it was fully held, fully on online. So this is the uh, our participation in Kagra. Uh, we are also contributing on Kagra uh, in various ways, and of course it includes the data analysis. But I'm I'll not talk about data analysis because it's very similar to LIGO, and. Uh, we have KGWG members uh, more active in character, uh, detector characterization in Kagra. So they, they have developed the uh, glitch classific classification algorithm using, uh, using machine learning algorithms and uh, also detector characterization tool using correlation uh, between main and auxiliary channels. So these, these are some examples of the uh, <clears throat> uh, correlation between main and auxiliary channels. Uh, 
but the uh, in Kagura there are more experimental elements. So the, there is a experimental group at Kazi who are working together with Kagura. Uh, they they are working on the high frequency squeezing for uh, this is. 1060, 1060 nanometer and 1550 nanometer lasers. So it's uh, the high frequency squeezing means that the squeezing mostly for reducing uh, reducing the shot noise. And also uh, in low frequency, uh, the radiation pressure become, becomes radiation pressure noise becomes important when you focus on the uh, focus on the high frequency frequency squeezing. So uh, we need uh, we need the frequency dependent squeezing. Uh, in order for that, uh, we need a filter cavity system. And uh, Kasi people are also collaborating with the Japanese. And uh, th actually this activity is uh, also uh, led by the uh, Italian groups. Recently, uh, Kasi provided the high quality sapphire input test mass uh, because their input test mass uh, is, is not uh, good enough. So they provided the uh, new material, which was developed by Aztec, which is a Korean company. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the quality of the New, uh, new ITMs are much better than the, uh, the ones which is installed in Kagura. So they will replace with the new, uh, new ITMs. So this is a very brief summary of the uh, contributions to Kagura. Uh, one of the, uh, one of, one of the uh, interesting things done uh, by the Korean group was actually the EM follow-up of the GW170 OA17, which is a neutron star merger event. So at that time, uh, Korea had uh, very nice facilities in Southern Hemisphere. And uh, this event uh, took place in Southern Hemisphere. So we, uh, we took this uh, opportunity to follow the uh, follow the electromagnetic radiation after the uh, gravitational wave event. So these facilities are uh, KMT net and uh, the, some small telescopes run by SNU. So KMT net is uh, composed of three telescopes uh, located in uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Australia, and Chile. So. Uh, so uh, you can immediately see that the, uh, they are uh, almost equally spaced over the globe. And uh, the purpose of this, uh, this particular telescope system was uh, to monitor some part of the sky 24 hours a day. So the, the, uh, the, the most uh, important field was galactic center. Gal uh, it's not the part center itself, but the uh, large area surrounded by the galactic center, which is called Bolgi, uh, in order to detect the microlensing. So this KMT means Korea Microlensing Telescope Network. And uh, each telescope is, uh, has a uh, 1.5 meter, uh, 1.5 meter primary mirror, and equipped with the uh, prime focus camera, which has a relatively wide field of view. And uh, SNU also runs a small telescope in South Australia, uh, which is called Isangak Telescope uh, in Siding Spring. So this was also extensively used to, uh, to monitor the uh, electromagnetic radiation coming from the GW 17 or 17 And uh, so, of course, this event was observed 
by many, many telescopes, including the X-ray telescope and, and, uh, and radio telescopes at six gigahertz, 19 gigahertz, and optical band, eye band, etc. And this is the uh, the uh, the variation of the uh, of the brightness of this event, and in particular, these green and blue dots are the ones covered by the KMT net. And as you can see, that uh, this data uh, is most uh, we the KMT net has uh, most densely covered. Uh, the brightness changes of this event. So um, this data was were used to do more detailed analysis together with the NASA group because NASA group had the X-ray data and, and uh, so we supplied the optical data, etc. So that was a uh, um, kind of luck, but this was uh, a very a spectacular result. <clears throat> and of course, we did uh, some more uh, some more studies with the uh, about the nature of, of the host galaxy. And um, this is one of the results we have obtained. Uh, we use the uh, detailed data of, of the detailed uh, spectral energy distribution of this uh, elliptical galaxy in order to understand the star formation history uh, because clearly the uh, gravitational wave merger event is associated with star formation history and uh, we found that the the age is not uh, very well constrained but could be uh, three to six giga years and uh, of course we cannot exclude that the, the is uh, more than 10 giga years. And um, we could not say anything about the origin of the neutron star binaries, but as this kind of data accumulates, I think we can understand uh, better about the uh, origin of neutron star binaries or whatever, uh, but gravitational wave sources. Also, we could uh, make uh, we were able to make an independent uh, distance estimation uh, using the fundamental plane argument. Fundamental plane is the uh, the three dimensional. Uh, I mean the the three parameters: the effective radius and uh, uh, velocity dispersion and surface brightness uh, space. They actually occupy some particular plane, uh, which means that the uh, these parameters have this linear relation and uh, and the uh, we can use this relation to obtain the um, actual distances because velocity dispersion and a bright a surface brightness are distance independent quantities on the other hand we could measure only the uh, effective radius on angular scale and uh, then uh, by applying this uh, fundamental plane equation, we can convert the, this uh, angular scale into a linear scale, kiloparsec, uh, by putting some distances. So that's how we obtain the distance. And uh, this is the uh, result we obtain. So it's not very uh, accurate, but uh, but it's, it's so consistent with the gravitational wave data analysis. Okay, so, uh, so far I have talked about the uh, Korean gravitational wave group. Then I will uh, change to some topics that is being done in our center or in, in my group at Seoul National University. One of the things uh, that have been done uh, together with my students is the accurate waveforms for long duration. Uh, so, so far, the uh, 
we we use the waveforms uh, for circular binaries, and the waveform the duration of waveform is relatively short because the uh, gravitational wave frequency uh, covered by the LIGO and, and Virgo and Kagra, these uh, ground-based detectors are relatively narrow as, uh, in the sense that the, it starts at around 30 hertz and uh, the highest uh, part is of around the kilohertz. And the duration of the gravitational wave uh, emission is typically uh, within a second uh, except for the neutron star binaries, which lasted for about two minutes. On the other hand, uh, the future gravitational wave detectors may cover uh, lower frequencies. And uh, if we can start observe the uh, from the low frequency band, then the gravitational wave lasts for a long, long time, much longer time. And uh, so the uh, derivation of gravitational wave waveform is more difficult. And also, uh, we may have some binaries which have uh, eccentricity. So if you have some eccentricities, then the, uh, you have to be more careful in uh, deriving the waveforms. And this is one of the illustration of the waveforms uh, depending on the uh, PN order. So uh, the orange line is 4 PN and uh, blue line is 2 PN, 3 PN. And by increasing the uh, PN order, you can see that the, uh, there is a deviation of gravitational waveforms uh, toward the uh, end of the uh, merger. So uh, we are trying to uh, develop the waveforms, which has, uh, which is based on higher order PN approximation. PN is post Newtonian approximation. So this is uh, show. Uh, this is one of the recent results, uh, which was published in early this year. And uh, of course, you, you have to also include the, uh, the spin and the machinery for the inclusion of spin has been developed, uh, but has not been incorporated in high order PN dynamics yet. So these are the ones we, we should do in the future. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, in my group, there have been some works on the numerical relativity. Uh, mostly by Yong Bok Bae, who was uh, a graduate student here. And uh, there are many applications of the numerical relativity because, uh, for example, the post-Newtonian I just talked about is a kind of a approximation. And at some point, you have to check the validity of the, this post-Newtonian against the numerical relativity. So the uh, we apply this to validation of PM waveforms with this centricity. Of course, uh, the numerical relativity is, is very expensive. You cannot do the uh, very long duration simulations. So you have to uh, focus on um, the, the late part of the, of the merger. And uh, so, uh, We have done uh, the high public uh, encounter, high public simulations. Now we are uh, doing various tests of post Newtonian, post Minkowskian approximations. Uh, and also, we mostly use the open source uh, called Cactus. Uh, but uh, in my group, there is a Postdoc working on the other method, and which is faster, and we, maybe you can incorporate this uh, faster method as well. Of course, it has its own uh, limitations. Okay, so 
Now, um, maybe I can introduce the center for the gravitational wave universe, uh, which is a research center supported by the NRF under the science, National Science Challenge Initiative Program. And uh, we were awarded uh, to this program uh, last year. And the annual budget is 200 million won per year. Of course, you can see that this duration of this support is four and a half years. So our total uh, total budget is uh, 4.5 times uh, this. So 900 million. <clears throat> uh, so our center is one of the five, cent five centers. And uh, our aim, uh, this is what we have proposed. We, uh, we wanted to have a rapid identification of the afterglows from the merger of neutron star binaries and for the identification of host galaxy and thus obtaining accurate and independent determination of Hubble custom. This is a long-term goal. And of, uh, in order for that, actually, uh, we have to construct a telescope system. And I, I'm going to talk about telescope system uh, in the next pages. Of course, we also carry out uh, theoretical studies for better understanding of gravitational wave sources and gravitational uh, electromagnetic counterparts. Uh, the gravitational wave forms, we will continue our effort to get uh, accurate gravitational waveforms from various eccentric binaries with spin, etc. And uh, simulation studies of gravitational wave cosmology with future detectors. And I will uh, show some examples of this, this one. And uh, maybe cross correlation between gravitational wave sources and galaxies which is actually proposed by other group, but uh, we, uh, we can do similar things uh, in our center. <clears throat> uh, we are currently composed of six permanent members and seven postdocs and several associate members and uh, also graduate students. Uh, we have uh, associate members and uh, I'd like to invite you if you are interested in as an associate member. Of course, it's not a paid position, but uh, we can keep a close collaboration with associate members. And you can visit uh, this homepage to see who are the asso current associate members. Uh, I'm so the. Uh, I, I talked about the Hubble, Hubble constant and Hubble, in order to measure Hubble constant, of course, you have to uh, measure the distances. And it has been well known for uh, that the, uh, we can actually determine the distance uh, to the gravitational wave sources without any help or with, without any uh, kind of calibration process because it's uh, purely uh, general relativity. So uh, this is the formula assuming the uh, 2.5 pn post-Newtonian gravitational waves, uh, very simple waveforms without considering this later part. But of course, this is sufficiently, uh, th this, this is, is not, of course, sufficient, but uh, this gives you the basic principles of the di distance measurement. But in practice, uh, it's not uh, really easy because uh, there is a big degeneracy between the distance and the inclination angle. So uh, this is the orbital plane of, of, of the binaries and this is the observer. And uh, this is the, the angle between the uh, orbital axis and the uh, line of sight. And depending on this angle, actually the, your uh, estimate distance changes a lot. But we don't have uh, any information about the uh, inclination angle. 
So without knowing the inclination angle, the uh, measurement of distance is very difficult. Or we can measure the distances, but the, uh, the range is huge. So in order to break the, uh, the inclination of this uh, degeneracy, maybe we can determine the uh, inclination angle based on other information, mostly from electromagnetic radiation. For example, uh, this is a paper I taken from the, uh, the Nature article that uh, we, uh, we took part. And uh, if the orbital plane is like this, and if there is a jet, and uh, if you see this uh, this event, your light curve looks like this, and uh, because there are two components of the electromagnetic radiation, which one is coming from the wind of the disk, uh, disk, uh, and uh, another is coming from the um, from the ejector which is moving very fast. And ejector interacts with the surrounding medium and uh, they emit the radiation, which is mostly uh, red. Red means that uh, low energy. And this, uh, the, the electromagnetic radiation coming from the disk is, uh, is bluer because disk is very hot. And this light curve uh, maybe depend. Light curve clearly depends on the uh, on the viewing angle or the uh, the angle between the line of sight and the axis. And furthermore, you can observe the gamma ray burst only if your opening angle is very narrow. So, to some extent, we can uh, constrain the opening angle. So, uh, but still, still the, um, our ability to constrain the opening angle is relatively, uh, is not a good, good enough. So for example, from the radio data, the constraint is uh, between 20 to 60 degrees. And then uh, there was a discovery of superluminal radio jet and uh, it gives the range of inclination angle more tightly, but still it's within uh, 14 degrees, et cetera. So even if we uh, added this kind of information, uh, we still, the, just for the, this, uh, this event, 1708-17 17, does not give a very precise uh, constraint on the Hubble constant yet. So, but maybe if we uh, detect the electromagnetic counterpart very early on, then uh, we may be able to constrain uh, the inclination angle further. So this is a hope. This is uh, one of the reasons uh, we are uh, also investing the, uh, the facilities for the early detection of gravitational wave counterpart. But this is the common status of the Hubble constant measurement from the gravitational waves uh, with uh, the neutron, binary neutron star event alone. Uh, the value is 69 plus 17 minus 8. And then adding the uh, dark siren, slight improvement, uh, but still it's not uh, good enough. And the, uh, the adding the superluminal motion constraint also gives us some improvement, but still it's not uh, enough. So what we can do uh, to detect the EM counterpart as early as possible is to have uh, some dedicated facility. So this is uh, uh, the 
the telescope we are constructing at the moment is called seven dimensional telescope and seven DT. And uh, it's composed of 20 telescopes of 50 centimeter aperture. So this, these are the telescopes. This is the, uh, uh, just the uh, imagination. Uh, we don't have this telescope system yet. Uh, and th with these telescopes, we can image, image wide field with 40 medium band filters uh, because each field telescope have uh, two filters each. And if we observe the same sky at the same time, then we can uh, have 40, 40 data points uh, with different frequency, different uh, wavelengths. And that gives you low resolution spectrum for every pixel in the field of view. And it can cover large area of sky repeatedly. And uh, so it, it uh, opens a kind of opportunity to do wide field time domain, uh, IFU type uh, spectroscopy. IFU is integral field unit. Uh, and uh, it, it's the uh, kind of device that can detect the spectrum for each pixel. But IFU has its uh, own specific design. But in our case, we use uh, many telescopes to cover different wavelengths. Uh, for the same field. So that's how we can obtain the spectrum uh, of the sky. And why it's called 7 dt is just an invention of the new name. So in principle, we can measure the position in the sky. Of course, distance is, uh, depends on how you measure the distance. But in principle, we can measure the uh, three-dimensional position in, this, in space and uh, because we can uh, observe repeatedly, uh, it's time dependent and the uh, flux at different wavelengths. And uh, if there is a spectral feature, we can use, uh, apply the Doppler formula to get the radial velocity. And that's why it's called a seven dimensional telescope. Uh, of course, you can obtain this seven dimensional uh, information only if for uh, some particular ideal cases. So the telescope explores the universe in seven dimensional uh, parameter space. And this is called 7DT. And this will be uh, located in uh, Chile, Chile and Chile and Andes uh, called uh, Rio Rutado. Uh, which is close to CTIO. CTIO is uh, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatories. Actually, in this side, we have also the KMTNet facility. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, I think it's about 100 kilometers uh, from, from CTIO site. Altitude is 1,700 meters and uh, 720 clear nights with very good sea. Uh, so this is Santiago, and this is a, a place we usually fly to go to the observatories, La Serena, and then we have to use the vehicles to uh, to go to to this observatory site. I just uh, point the CTIO site, and uh, Rio Tarto is very close from here, at least in this map. And currently, uh, we we will. Uh, but we ordered all 20 telescopes, but the manufacturer cannot provide them at the same time. And uh, five telescopes will be delivered uh, probably uh, by the end of this year or early next year. And that's, uh, that's good enough for us to, to start the observation uh, together with the first observing drone of light. And this advantage of this uh, medium band spectrum is that the, uh, for example, this, this is a quasar spectrum and the a black line is a real high, high resolution spectrum taken by SDSS. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the LSST have white, only white band filters, so they can uh, cover these blue dot blue uh, squares. But the uh, 7DS can get the data on these red squares, and uh, you can have a, a reasonable spectrum. And uh, so because of this uh, spectroscopic capability, we can obtain the redshift of the object within uh, sometimes, in some cases, of 0.3%, uh, but in uh, some cases, one point accuracy. And on top of that, we can just easily distinguish between uh, supernova and the kilonova, et cetera. And uh, this is the uh, main advantage of the, uh, of the 7DT. Okay, so far I talked about the 7DT and maybe I will close my talk by introducing one uh, particular subject, which is the uh, futuristic works and I said that the current detectors are operating between 30 and kilohertz, but there are many uh, detectors uh, proposed that cover different uh, frequencies, most notably the LISA. LISA will cover the, these frequencies. Uh, between LISA and ground-based detectors, there is a gap uh, around uh, 0.1 hertz, and this can be covered by the uh, mid-frequency detectors uh, one of the them is uh, the Saigo proposed by Japanese community, but there are many other uh, concepts, mostly uh, located in space. And if you have the detector operates at these wavelengths, with these frequencies, actually you can cover the uh, merger event for a long time. For example, this is a, a the parameter for the first gravitational wave source in uh, 2015. And uh, if we can start from the 0.05 hertz, for example, then uh, this is 60 days before the merger. So you can observe uh, for at least for 60 days until merger. And even with the, uh, the frequency around four hertz, Actually, you can uh, you can observe this for one minute, uh, which is significant increase from the previous uh, 0.2 second. And if, if you can observe these events for a long time, you can actually uh, the accuracies of the uh, sky localization and luminous distance can be significantly improved, uh, just because the the relative uh, relative angle between, I mean, the, the, the plane of the uh, gravitational wave detector uh, changes over time. And uh, using this kind of information, if, if this, this uh, telescope uh, actual configuration changes, then you will see the modulation of gravitational wave amplitude and that modulation uh, can be used to constrain uh, these parameters more accurately. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, with H, H is the uh, the atom interferometer uh, based detector, and if we use parameter for H, uh, we can also estimate how how uh, these, param these uh, parameters uh, to the gravitational waves can be improved. And uh, this is one uh, <coughs> realization of, of the uh, Monte Carlo simulations that the, uh, depending on the redshift, you can define the uh, localization volume. Localization volume means since we have uncertainty in the <coughs> uh, area of the sky and distances, you can, uh, because of the, this uncertainty in area and distance, you can define the uh, localization, uh, localization volume. And if the localization volume is smaller than the, uh, the 
typical volume occupied by typical galaxy, then you can uh, uniquely identify the uh, host galaxy. So that's uh, called the, <clears throat> what you call golden event. And uh, using this kind of information, uh, luminosity distance and uh, redshift, you can draw the Hubble diagram. And using this Hubble diagram, you can just uh, estimate the Hubble constant, et cetera. That's, uh, that's how we improve the uh, Hubble constant. And if you can detect five golden dark BNS, dark BNS means that although you are observing BNS, you don't actually uh, see the electromagnetic uh, waves because they are too far away. Then uh, you can constrain the Hubble constant in this way. And of course, this is not enough to resolve the Hubble tension right now. But as the number of the uh, events, golden events increase, uh, the distance, Hubble constant uh, error becomes reduced. So we can resolve the Hubble tension even with a small number of golden events. Small means well, order of 10 or a few tens. Okay, uh, so this, but on, in, in this work, we assume that the binaries are on a circular orbit, but uh, maybe some binaries are on eccentric orbit. And I will not go through all the details of the eccentricity, but uh, there is a possibility that some binaries up to 10% or a few percent uh, can be uh, eccentric. And the, the fraction of the binaries with the eccentric eccentricity will increase uh, to the uh, when we start to observe at low frequencies. And so the if the uh, there there are some eccentricities, then we can uh, improve the parameters, especially the uh, localization and the uh, and the uh, distances. And uh, this is uh, one of the recent uh, results that the showing that the uh, most of the binaries, uh, the this R is the relative uh, improvement with eccentricity. And uh, if you have uh, eccentricity, then the the estimated uh, localization is improved significantly depending on the uh, inclination angle, but it could be as large as, could be a more than order of magnitude and some, in some case two orders of magnitude. That means that we can really, uh, cons we can really identify the host galaxies without the aid of the electromagnetic counterpart. So, um, so the, this means that the uh, mid-frequency detectors are really uh, very important for uh, doing cosmology, uh, etc. And uh, we, we, uh, this is uh, something about the numerical relativity. But let me just quickly summarize. So uh, I talked about the gravitational wave group, and uh, we started in early 2000 and became involved with LIGO and Kagura, mostly data analysis. And we are slowly expanding to experimental areas, but still our experimental group and the scope of the experimental group is very, very limited. Uh, in 2017, KMTNet of the CACI and other telescopes operated by SNU made a significant contribution in observing EM counterpart of the GW17 OA17 event. And uh, uh, the inauguration of the our center uh, at SNU allows us to construct 7DT, which will carry out uh, many interesting uh, surveys. I didn't talk about the other surveys uh, than the uh, EM counterpart, but the uh, rapid follow-up 
uh, is one of the uh, main main purposes of the 70T. And uh, also our center will foster uh, many gravitational related science projects, theoretical and observational. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, such a nice overview of all the activities that uh, you have been carrying out. And uh, you know that uh, at least uh, we, are, we are more like um, in particle physics uh, in uh, with the group of Professor Skopel. And of course here at CQA there are more people in doing uh, general activity and other um, more, maybe more related areas uh, to to your field, uh, but I think that uh, our interest was just you know to know about uh, what kind of um, research research is being doing, because uh, now there there are many many opportunities uh, for uh, thinking of models that predict gravitational waves from cosmological origin. And I think the, uh, it will be a very um, intense area of research, the analysis of these kind of uh, sources. So I, uh, in that uh, regard, I was wondering if you are starting thinking on jumping in some you know, group, for example, in LIGO, that you being, are you part of it? in analyzing this kind of uh, sources of cosmo uh, cosmological origin. Yeah, of course, in LIGO, there is a group called uh, the background. It's a stochastic group. Stochastic means uh, there will be a stochastic radiation, which is equivalent to the uh, background, cosmological background radiation in uh, electromagnetic waves. So, uh, of course, there, there are two sources of stochastic, uh, stochastic waves. One is just unresolved gravitational wave sources at uh, further distances, and the other is really coming from the uh, cosmological origin, which is uh, density perturbations, etc. So this is one of the uh, very active areas of research in uh, uh, LIGO, but because LIGO uh, has a frequency band which is relatively high, um, most likely source of the LIGO will be the, the unresolved uh, gravitational wave sources at large distances. But there, there are people working on the uh, Gravitational waves from from the uh, from the strings, cosmic strings, etc. And uh, also uh, for that uh, part, I think the recently the PTA, a pulsar timing array, they are uh, doing a very active research on the uh, on stochastic gravitational waves. Of course, in the mid, mid frequencies and the stochastic background will be more important. Yes, I, no, I understand that the involvement of the LIGO collaboration, but I wanted to understand if there is already a Korean in, involvement. Oh, in Korea, no, there is nobody working on this stochastic. Mm -hmm. Well, our group is relatively small, so uh, we cannot do mm -hmm. everything. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. I, I don't know if uh, any of you have more questions. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank for the uh, very nice uh, review of the Korean uh, activity in gravitational wave. Uh, as you may know, the many members at CQF, our center uh, actually working on uh, uh, not just the general relativity, but uh, uh, extension of general relativity or modified gravity, like uh, scalar uh, uh, metric theory uh, or string theory extension of general relativity. <laughs> so, 
I'd like to ask you whether uh, about the uh, I'd like to ask you to give some uh, comment or the outlook regarding the test of uh, modified gravity or more precision test of uh, general relativity. Or, so, and also, if possible, some uh, Korean uh, um, uh, participation uh, at this uh, angle. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so there is also uh, also active group doing the test of general relativity, and in this test, it's, it's mostly the parameterized test, meaning that the post-Newtonian um, terms. So we know the post-Newtonian coefficient for um, for strong field and first order, second order, etc., and and they are looking for the uh, possible deviation from the GR post-Newtonian uh, coefficient. Of course, so far they haven't found anything yet. So this, but I, I don't know whether they actually uh, use any particular theory, they uh, apply any particular theory, and it has to be uh, in the strong gravity, uh, gravity uh, region. If it's uh, in, in the far away effect, you, you will not be able to see it. Uh, so mostly for the um, the strong strong regime. And uh, there is, I think there is one person who was doing a uh, test of general relativity. His name is Kyungmin Kim, uh, because he was part of the uh, uh, leader are part of the group at Hong Kong uh, doing test of general relativity. Uh, so he may be, at least in the, uh, in the MOU, uh, I didn't see any mention about test of general relativity, but he's quite familiar. And uh, he did some work uh, together with this Hong Kong group while he was posted up there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, uh, Hyungmo, I also have some question. Uh, part of the question is related to Dong Hyuk's question. Yeah. So since, uh, uh, I guess, especially in Sogang, there are some people working on gravity. Uh, some models may uh, give some different properties of the black hole. So in yeah. other words, uh, the merging process of the those two uh, uh, black hole mergers, the gravitational wave may be somewhat different uh, according to uh, mm -hmm. those models. Even though uh, the models has hasn't been uh, studied uh, detail, uh, especially numerically. So I think I mean the uh, since you mentioned uh, the uh, some uh, numerical uh, group. Uh, in the uh, Korean, uh, so KW, uh, KGWG. So I think, I mean, the, if uh, there is some chance to cooperate uh, with uh, working with a specific model uh, in which some Koreans, uh, uh, Koreans have some expertise, then that may be also a good contribution to the gravitational wave detection because uh, it may give some uh, limit, at least, uh, for the models beyond Einstein. Yeah. Uh, that's um, partly the uh, question and the uh, comments. And the second thing is, you mentioned in your previous part, uh, the uh, timeline of the uh, LIGO, where there is a uh, there has been already some couple of years break uh, during which uh, you are upgrading to the advanced LIGO and also some years later, so A plus, uh, after some years of the, uh, uh, I guess, upgrading process. Are there any plan uh, for the uh, Korean team to participate the uh, in that uh, upgrading uh, level, I mean, the, through some uh, optical system or through some instrumentation or whatever. Okay, uh, so let me uh, answer to your first one first, and then uh, to the next. 
so for the uh, numerical relativity, actually, if you can provide uh, any kind of suitable way of, uh, for example, modifying the uh, modifying the metric, uh, then I think it can be easily incorporated in the numerical simulation. And I think the outcome will be uh, somewhat different waveforms uh, just at, uh, before and just after the merger. For example, if there is no uh, event horizon, there will be no uh, ring down. And uh, ring down has not been uh, fully detected yet, uh, although it has been inferred. So I think the uh, at least there exists the event horizon. And the uh, of course, but the size of the event horizon, if the size of the event horizon is different, you will have different uh, frequencies of the ring down waves, uh, etc. So uh, I think this can be easily incorporated in the numerical relativity. So if you have any uh, particular model in mind, uh, we can can have a, a meeting and see if we can incorporate. And the second part, uh, actually LIGO uh, experimental group is really strong. So that's why we are not uh, doing anything on LIGO. On the other hand, uh, Kagra, uh, they are serious lack of uh, manpower and resources and they <laughs> need more help. So that's why we are more concentrating on Kagra. But uh, participating in LIGO experiment is really difficult. Uh, the 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 reason why some members became involved in in coding is of course it's it's uh, kind of R and D part. It's not really really doing coding, but we are trying to find the uh, best material for the coding. And uh, the, this person Jung Ha Lee at uh, Songyong Gwan University uh, was a postdoc at uh, Stanford University, and she was doing this kind of research when she was a postdoc there. And uh, she came back to Korea and uh, we have very good facilities uh, for this kind of research because the uh, TEM, Transmission Electromagnetic uh, Electron um, Microscope in Korea are really good. So uh, she has a good uh, position in carrying out uh, her current works in Korea, and, but, but uh, other other things like uh, squeezing and uh, other parts, it's uh, so really uh, the LIGO team is very, very mature and there's not much room for us to, to participate. Maybe we can uh, we, we get more gain on, on the uh, on, with the with the CAGRA, then we can do I think what we are aiming actually uh, to participate in uh, in Einstein telescope, which is more futuristic. But the current uh, project is, uh, I would say it's very difficult. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, clear explanation. Okay, so maybe I have a, a question. Uh, uh, you gave a very nice uh, uh, overview of the prospects of solving the Hubble uh, tension uh, using gravitational waves. And I think it's a very hot topic. And uh, uh, in particular, you showed that, uh, for instance, with 10 golden events, uh, you could, in principle, get very precision, precise measurements. But of course, this uh, is a very difficult task. You need a a dedicated detector, an early detection of the physical counterpart. You gave a very nice review. So I'm just curious, what are the main challenges and the time scale that you can imagine to get there? Okay, so the the ones I mentioned about the golden event is uh, the, you assuming that we will have a mid-frequency detector. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, there is no uh, confirmed project on mid-frequency detector. So this is just purely based on the uh, our imagination, and I don't know time scale, but the LISA itself will be flown only in uh, late 2030s, and 
although the, the mid frequency detectors may be easier than uh, than LISA because the separation uh, is required separation is only a few thousand kilometers or for the uh, atom interferometers I don't know it's, it may be even smaller but the uh, this community is more concentrating on LISA and uh, there are not much resources on the mid frequency detectors. Uh, but we, we are emphasizing that uh, maybe it has more uh, richer science than LISA, at least for the uh, point of view of cosmology, et cetera. And uh, if we have very good reasons, there might be some people try to put up the mid frequency detector early on. So, but I will say that it's it's beyond uh, twenty years or something like that. Okay, thank you. Using EM counterpart, you can also do the same thing. But there are other many other issues like uh, uh, like uh, uh, equation of dark energy, equation of state of the dark energy, etc. Because uh, at that point, the these sources maybe. Uh, beyond redshift of 0.1 or 0.2, then you have to really worry about the background models. And everything depends on the background models. And then that they are inter-tangled. Uh, so there are other issues we, we have to look, look into. Thank you. Uh, 